from uh, School of Computer Science uh, at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here to uh, present in this meeting. And what I'll be uh, talking about is uh, quite different from what you have heard so far. And uh, this is, I think, it's a very important application domain for um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, but uh, I would like to argue that, um, um, you know, in order to uh, realize uh, the great potential of these algorithms, we really need to understand how the system is actually working, how the biological system is working, because it's simply uh, probably much more complicated than we thought. So it's amply um, evident that these new um, high through bike technologies that uh, we have uh, seen uh, in the past decade, a couple of decades, have the great potential uh, to achieve um, high definition um, you know, precision medicine um, to enhance our um, healthcare and also well-being by acquiring various types of data sets in different um, uh, modalities. And uh, collectively, uh, they can um, improve our understanding of how our um, 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 body is working and also how the human disease can be, can be um, cured uh, better. However, there are tremendous challenges in analyzing this massive amount of data, as you probably have heard, um, due to the fact that these data sets are simply uh, high dimensional and multi model, and uh, they're, they're uh, interconnected as in the biological system. There are different uh, constituents and they are all uh, connected to each other and they are dynamic and het heterogeneous. And I'll show, uh, show you some examples later. Uh, one of the uh, most um, 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 important challenges in precision medicine is to uncover the molecular basis for human disease. And uh, one of the uh, examples of, uh, well, I give here is Steve Jobs who passed away about seven years ago from pancreatic cancer. And uh, if you read this um, biography written by Walter Isaacson, it says Jobs spent uh, $100,000 to learn the DNA sequence of his genome and that of the tumors killing him. Jobs was uh, jumping between treatments and hoped DNA would provide clues about where to turn next. Unfortunately, uh, none of those um, uh, plans uh, worked from um, looking at the DNA sequence. And why that's the case? Because we actually do not know, we still have not figure out a way to fully understand the molecular causes for most of human diseases, certainly including cancer. Um, of course, the promise is that if you acquire enough amount of data and you develop uh, good enough algorithms, maybe someday, soon, you will be able to figure out how human um, diseases are, are, are working and what will be the appropriate treatment for different types of disease in a personalized manner. And you probably have seen this plot many times. This is a plot showing uh, the cost of sequencing um, one genome, the cost of sequencing one genome, um, uh, what has changed in the past uh, 18 years or so. And it uh, exceedingly, um, uh, the, the progress is, uh, 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 the progress we have made in DNA sequencing has uh, exceeded the um, most law. And right now, it probably costs less than $1,000 to sequence the entire genome. And this is certainly one of the most disruptive technologies in the past decade. And it's interesting that the people have estimated that by the, by the year 2025, um, there will be more genomic data than um, data from YouTube, all the data from YouTube, Twitter, um, astronomy, actually, combined. And I'll give you a very um, brief overview, um, of a little tutorial on uh, what human genome is, and then some of the fundamental uh, questions that we are facing in systems biology and genomic medicine. So we know that in our body, it's widely acknowledged that there are more than 10 trillion cells, and each cell has a genome with 23 pairs of chromosomes. So there are 3 billion base pairs, these letters A, C, G, T, that uh, constitutes of, of our, our uh, genome, and uh, less than 2% of the genome for, for proteins. And certainly these proteins will work together to perform various cellular functions in our body. And there are many interesting early applications of machine learning in um, 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 genome, in computational genomics. For example, there are in, 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 in mid to late 90s, there are um, a lot of applications using the Markov model, actually, to try to annotate the genome, where the genes are, so you can learn from the existing um, annotations and try to uh, apply them to annotate to uh, 
uh, unknown uh, to, to uh, new genomes. And there are all, more than 200 different cell types in our body. So each cell in different cell types, even though they have different cell types, they actually have the same genome. They have the same DNA, but they have different gene regulations that are mostly driven by the epigenome. And in um, very recently, actually, in the past uh, five years or so, the development of single cell technology provides us a much closer view of what's going on in these different cell types and cell states including um, the comparisons between uh, normal and disease states. And there are actually, in the past uh, three, four years also, there are uh, quite a few interesting deep learning based approaches uh, that are emerging. There are, people are using these uh, peak neck structures to help us um, understand you know, the DNA and their, their interaction with the other different kinds of molecules in different cell types um, in different conditions. Um, but our genome is not a linear string. Is if you stitch the DNAs um, together in our genome, it's about five to six feet long, but uh, they are actually folded and packaged into a five micrometer cell nucleus, as you see here on, on the left hand side. And these chromosomes are also compartmentalize to different subcellular structures. This is very intriguing um, because even though you know this organization seems very complicated, it's actually highly, highly regulated in progression and disruption to disease. Unfortunately, the principles of such uh, three-dimensional three organization are largely unclear. So I'll give you one example. So my group have been developing some of the, um, um, I think, the, the first set of sort of these machine learning methods that can, we can apply uh, in order to uncover some of the principles in these three gene, uh, gene organizations. All I have mentioned so far is different kinds of phenomena in our cell and our body. Keep in mind that they are all interacting with each other. So at the systems level, they are for, they can form this kind of a, 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 a network, if you will. And and um, and uh, for for instance, people have uh, ten these insights of disease causing mutations. They don't exist in uh, uh, singletons, but they actually form. They actually work together. And if you look at the single mutations, they don't um, they, they they exhibit a very high degree of heterogeneity. But it will be. Um, it is actually very important to look at the impact of these mutations uh, together in the context of the network in order to fully understand what we actually do in ourselves. So, um, I'll give you um, a few examples of uh, our recent works, some of our recent works um, in, uh, to develop uh, uh, both supervised and unsupervised uh, methods to um, study several different aspects of um, the genome and then how our DNA is and how the biological system is actually working. And this, for example, is um, if you, um, the, the idea is that if you sequence a uh, uh, tumor patient's genome, we want to achieve the goal of characterizing um, all the complex genomic alterations in tumor cells. In normal genomes, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. But in tumor genomes, typically that's not the case. We have, so sometimes you may see um, certain chromosomes will have four or five copies, even more copies. And in addition to that, these different chromosomes can uh, interact with each other, they can swap genomic content. Uh, these so called uh, structural variations and also copy number alterations in uh, an aneuploid tumor genome. So previously we developed uh, a, a method based upon um, this problem's graphical model, Marco Random Field to identify such complex alterations. And we found that, as so you can see on the right hand side, I won't have time to get into the details to explain, but this uh, plot, this figure shows that we can recognize uh, complex alterations and how they're actually being connected in the tumor genome. One interesting finding is that patterns of these complex alterations correlate with disease outcomes and also other clinical variables, for instance, um, um, survivors from um, tumor patients. So, um, as I mentioned, um, the, these, these constituents, right, these different components, they work together. So, for instance, we develop um, high dimensional graphical models to infer these um, georegulatory net networks. And we we're particularly interested in the network level differences between two different cancer subtypes. And on the left hand side, I'm showing you an example between breast cancer luminal A subtype and basal type. This is one example of the net at the network level, what is the gene interaction differences between the two. So the colors are showing different interactions in these two different uh, tumor subtypes. And 
uh, we can use these network structures actually can uh, help us review important cancer mutation combinations. I mentioned these mutations may um, work together. So um, um, on the right hand side, we use the constraint form of correlation clustering to identify a group of mutations that uh, actually work together in the context of a network and form these network structures. However, they actually do not co occur in single, uh, uh, mostly do, do not co occur in a single uh, cancer patient which is also intriguing. So for the three-dimensional um, chromatin structure, chrom chromosome structure that I mentioned earlier, um, we recently uh, borrowed ideas from natural language processing, in particular these word embedding models, to help us uh, review the importance of sequence, DNA sequence, in determining uh, some of these phenomena we observe in the cell. So for instance, um, we uh, developed a, a predictive model that you use um, a sequence kamer, say kamer 6 or 7 as, as a word, and you look at which word is more important in certain contexts where the string, the, the, the sentence becomes, it is, is, is a longer uh, strings of DNA. And on the right hand side, we also um, uh, proposed a deep neural network structure for predicting long range chromatin rashes, where we consider, we look at a, a pair of sequences and a CNN will capture the sequences and then a, a, it is followed by a, a LSTM that captures the long range dependencies of the sequences that you are looking at right now. Um, and finally, um, um, there, are, there are different, different kinds of um, different uh, model uh, data from different modalities, right? You can acquire them, for instance, in the context of um, cancer diagnosis and treatment. Um, we uh, may uh, look at both imaging data and also genomic information. Um, but we realized that um, it seems that in these two different um, areas, people typically work only with one data set. And what is the connection between these two different modalities? Can we use data set from one um, um, say from imaging, can we use imaging to predict what's going on in the genomics and can we use genomics data to predict phenotypes in images? Like you truly understand what are the features that are complementary to each other and what are the features that might be um, actually redundant. Um, so like in this case, uh, in this example, a uh, very small example, so we used um, the uh, breast cancer histopathology HNE stain images on the right hand side. We can actually predict uh, the breast cancer subtype, uh, which are determined by looking at gene expression profiles on the left-hand side. And we're also currently working on methods that can jointly model single cell genome uh, data, uh, and also high throughput image-based single cell data to uh, study the complexity of cells in human tissues. Um, so, here's a summary. So, uh, I have mentioned uh, um, uh, all these uh, points that I won't uh, uh, read them, but I hope I have uh, conveyed the idea uh, that I think um, uh, AI and machine learning, I think in, in biomedicine, is certainly a very promising direction. Um, um, however, I would like to um, argue that uh, I think we um, really need to uh, uh, understand uh, the, um, the um, understand the biology. Uh, like why we are developing these algorithms. And human disease and human body is, is, is not a singular view uh, system. It's, it's not a bunch of images. It's not a, just a, 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 a bunch of DNA sequences. Um, it's not uh, some other measurements of our, of our uh, uh, say, metabolic systems in our body. It's actually all of them, right? So, um, ideally, so we need to uh, develop uh, algorithms that can um, uh, fundamentally uncover the molecular uh, basis for um, um, uh, human uh, biological system in the human disease in order to uh, fully um, accomplish 